this moment to welcome you this morning to today's uh, presentation. And I must state, uh, so that we're all on the same page, that um, I am in the midst of celebrating 10 years as Frederick Douglass. I started out in 2009, and I got to go back because I started to say, I started out in 1966. <laughs> <laughs> You're in my head. I started out in uh, 2009, and I'm going to answer the question before the question comes to me at the end of the Q&A. Um, the question is always approaches me as to what started me to doing Frederick Douglass. Well, believe it or not, um, I got up, and as weird as it may sound in this political correct world that we live in, I got up preparing myself for my day, brushing my teeth. As I'm brushing my teeth in the mirror, I heard three times, Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass. And without, well, quite naturally, I looked around to see was anybody in the room with me because, you know, I'm thinking I'm hearing things. So, immediately after getting myself together, I went down next door to the, it was the Performing Arts Center, and I rented out the Tico Center Theater, and I hadn't, at that time, had a grip, if you will, on Frederick Douglass and on his life, so I would just share with you that uh, which I still carry to today, my cheat sheet, which I don't even use anymore, but I still carry it with me. So at the time, my first presentation, 50 people in the audience, I just stood there and I read the whole thing. <laughs> Nervous as can be, and believe it or not, when it was all said and done, all 50 of, of the wonderful people supplying this, uh, occupying the seats, they got up and gave me a standing ovation. And the rest is history, and here we are, just as fast, 10 years later. Performing Frederick Douglass, I've had the opportunity to, to travel throughout America. When the late Aretha Franklin passed away, I don't know if you saw the pictures of her laying in the casket with the beautiful red dress and the legs crossed. That was the Charles Wright Museum, and as a matter of fact, uh, Valentine's Day, they had a Frederick Douglass pre presentation and had a picture of the gentleman doing Frederick Douglass. And quite naturally, I'm being biased because for some reason, I still don't know, I still don't know why, but for some reason, I look just like him. And I'm the only uh, gentleman, man, black man, however you want to call me, that uh, to this day I've noticed that look exactly like him. And that's a blessing. Upon itself. Um, like I said, I've, it's just been amazing. It's, it's been an uh, amazing ride, you know, and, and I'm thankful and I'm thankful to you all coming out this morning. Without any further ado, let's get the show started. Those slave 
slaveholders, holding those slaves is illegal. And I am determined to do something about it. Well, John, if that's your quest, so where are you bunking at? Well, Fred, I was hoping I could stay here. <laughs> um, maybe three weeks to get myself together? Sure, John, sure, no problem. And guess what, John, because you're such a friend of mine, you can stay for free. <laughs> Fred, I insist that you charge me for staying here. So be it. If you wish me to charge you, I'll charge you. Three dollars a week. I can handle that. Okay, cool. Now, that's just a little piece of John Brown visiting me in Rochester, New York. John Brown, as I stated, he came up because his main mission was to take out the slave owners in Harper's Valley. I told John that he was making a terrible mistake and please don't do it. John almost got on his knees and begged me to go with him. Now understand, my name is Frederick Douglass and my name is out there. My images are out there and I know that there are people out there that would love to hang me. So I told John, I, as much as I would love to go, I will not go. John stayed at my house for three weeks. In that three weeks, he got on everybody's nerves. But, believe it or not, my daughter, Rosetta, at the time, she was small, she loved John. She loved the stories John told, and she loved the fact that John, he was going out to kill somebody. So he became, she became good friends with John. Well, I recall one time I invited some guests over, some distinguished guests, some high polluted, if you will, guests of mine, who walks around with their head up in the sky. And John came, I, I invited them over because I really wanted them to meet John. And not only that, I wanted to raise funds for John, for his supplies that he would need on his quest, on his venture. Well, believe it or not, my guest that came over, he ran them away because of the fact that he was so aggressive with them. But he ran them away, however, he, he didn't run their pockets away because he managed to get in his pocket, in their pocket. So they donated to the cause. Well, on the day that John was scheduled to go to Harper's Valley, he requested that I meet him in Niagara Falls, which I did. Well, believe it or not, when, when John came, I was wondering, well, who is this? Well, John was in a disguise. He was in a disguise as, <laughs> believe it or not, a fisherman. But I noticed that John did not have any fish with him. And I'm like, Some, what's wrong with this picture? And I said, John, as he approached, John, is that you? He said, yes, Fred. I said, what's going on with the outfit? He said, well, I didn't want to be detected, so I even changed my last name to John Smith. I said, oh, okay, Mr. Smith. Well, come on over, Mr. Smith. So we, we sat down on the log and we started talking. And once again, he tried to convince me. He had a couple of black men with him. And these young black men believed in John Brown. Shields Green was one of the young men. And I walked over to Shields Green and I said, Shields Green, do you really want to go and do this? I have a feeling that if you do this, you will lose your life. If you do this, you will hang at the galleys. Are you really sure you would want to do this? And his only reply was, I must go with the old man. Well, my dear friend John Brown and I, we hugged each other. He whispered in my ear and he said, Fred, I really wish you would go. And I responded by John I'm begging you not to go. And then we, we released each other, and he had me by my arms, and he just kind of shook me a little bit. And he said, my dear friend, don't worry about me because we're going to win. And he released me, and all I saw was them walking off or riding off into the sunset. Well, a couple of weeks later, 
Word had traveled back to me, as you may know, they had killed my friend, John Brown, and they killed Shields Green and most of the men that was with him. They hung my friend at the gallows. Unlike in your world today, if a murderer is captured and they take him to the electric chair far away from the civilian eyes, this hanging of my friend John was in the public square. So everyone got a chance to see my friend hang. I felt it and I took it upon myself that I must leave this country immediately. I must leave because of the fact my name, Frederick Douglass. I must leave because I'm sure that the townspeople, the government, the officers would swear up and down that I was the one who coerced John Brown. I was the one who put John Brown up to this. I was the one who supplied John Brown all of his needs in this, in this quest, which I didn't. However, let the true story be told, I did supply him <coughs> with the funding. I did supply him with the food. And I might have went on, on the edge and supplied him with some clothing. But as far as guns, no. I didn't believe in, believe me, I was a warrior, but I didn't believe in guns. Well, I left as I stated. I went to Canada, but Canada was too close. It was too close because they can come right across the border and they could capture me. So I took a 14 day trip on the icy waters at 14 degrees, choppy waters to England. And while there for exactly two years, I began speaking and I spoke at sold out, sold out auditoriums, churches, and you have it. And I'll also let you know this. Unlike in America, one day I was walking, and would you believe a dog came up to me? And the dog jumped up on my, on my leg and wagging his tail, and he was going, ah, 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 ah. and I looked down at the dog, and I thought to myself, wow. Even a dog recognizes and loves a black man over here. <laughs> wow, I'm famous. Well, as I stated, I stayed in England for two years, and I met some very influential friends, and one of the friends come to mind is Miss Richardson. Uh, another friend of mine who I met, Miss uh, Staten, and a few others, such as Mr. O'Connell. So we were all at a social gathering. And, of course, I'm taking advantage of my freedom. So I'm sipping on my wine and just observing, having a moment to myself. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Miss Richardson, she comes to me with Miss Stanton. And they greet, and we greet each other. Madam, how are you? And she comes out and she says, Frederick. And I'm like, yes. We got some news for you. Oh, I'm always good for some good news. She says, we sent $750 to your master. He won't. Oh, you are officially a free man. So in them sending me this, sending my master the $750, believe it or not, Ms. Richardson says, Frederick, how about you send for your family and you come to America? I mean, you stay here and you can be free. And nobody can detect you. No one will bother you. And I'm like, hmm, as I sipped, as I sipped, and as I sipped. Because I'm still thinking I'm hearing what they're saying, but F-R-E-E -E has not resonated yet. 
So they're talking to me, and I'm still thinking, free. I'm free. And I had these visions that come up that showed me as a free man, I'm free. And I dated back to the time when I was that little boy, that little slave boy that was born on the Tuckahoe near the Hillsboro in eastern Maryland on one of the largest plantation in Maryland, the Lord's Plantation. They had 500 slaves, the largest plantation. As a matter of fact, Lloyd's Plantation did not one time have to signal out for help because they had everything they need but the slaves they had there. They say I was born on February the 14th, 1818. My mother, Harriet Bailey, and to you all, Miss Harriet Bailey, she would run 12 miles three times a week to come see me. Can you imagine? I'm looking at you all with shoes on, but can you imagine running through the woods in the pit of the dark 12 miles to see your baby? And please understand, we're talking about 1818, 1819. There's no electricity. So we very seldom got a chance to see each other. They say my mother was very, very dark skinned. And she would come in and pick me up and she would sing to me. And she created this song, My Little Valentine. And that's why I suppose that I was born on February the 14th, 201 years ago. So please don't touch me. I don't want the dust to come out. <laughs> well, my grandmother, Betty Bailey, who I really got attached to, she was really like my mother. She would be there for my every awakening need. Well, she must have knew something I didn't because we went on this long walk, felt like it was like 100 miles, but in reality it was only maybe about 15 miles. As old as my grandmother was, sometimes she would pick me up and carry me. As old as she was, sometimes she would put me on her back and, and walk with me. And when we made it to our destination, there was a young lady, and all I remember her is, all I remember of her is Miss Katie, or Aunt Katie. Aunt Katie was very stern and mean, especially to me. I couldn't understand that. Every chance she got, she would spank me. Every chance she got, she would spank me. Every time she got, she would push me. Every chance she got, when all the other kids would eat, she would try to starve me. But I will let you know that my mother, Harriet Bailey, just happened to pop up out of nowhere. And sir, my mother and Miss Katie, or Aunt Katie, they got into it. No, they didn't get into it such as, but they got into a verbal war. And my mother told Aunt Katie, if you touch my son one more time, I'm going to have something for you. Well, <laughs> I have you know, as long as my mother was there, sir, she didn't touch me. But once my mother left, and was gone for maybe about two or three days, because it would take a while to get back on feet. Aunt Katie, we began to torment me again. My grandmother, the day she took me, she told me, Frederick, go out and play. She wanted me to go play with the other kids. The other kids were my cousins, my brothers, and my sisters. I told her, Grandma, I don't want to go out there. I want to stay with you. That's how attached I was to her. I don't want to go out. I want to stay with you. Well, she grabbed me, and she took me outside. And I just stood there crying because I didn't want to play. I wanted to be with my grandmother. All of a sudden, in my crying, she said, I'm going to the kitchen to get something for you. And I'm like, okay, okay. In reality, my brother came to me and said, Frederick, stop crying and come play with us. And I said, no, leave me alone, as a child would say. 
No, leave me alone. And I don't want to be bothered, as a child would say. I want my grandmother. And my brother came out of his mouth and said, Grandma's gone. Uh-uh, you joshing me. Grandma's gone. So at that moment, I took off into the kitchen to look for my grand grandma. Grandma, grandma. And all of a sudden, I went to the other rooms and I hollered upstairs. There was no feedback. Grandma was gone. And the next time I heard word about my grandmother, she had died. My mother had died. And it's almost, for those, well, at least for my mother, it's almost when I finish with this container without any thought or repercussion, I take it and I throw it in the garbage and I go about my business. Because my mother and I had, had not had a good connection, that's the way I felt when the word came that she had died. There was no feeling. It was like the wall. But when my grandmother died, and then I found out what they did to my grandmother, they put her out in a, in a cabin by herself. And when she became really old and senile and she passed, they just went outside the cabin and they dug a hole and they just put a carcass in the hole. That stunned me. That hurted me to the core. Moving on, they say my father, because I know you're wondering who my father was, they say my father was Aaron Anthony. Aaron Anthony, they called him Captain Aaron Anthony. They called him Captain Anthony because of the fact that on the weekends he would put his sailor cap on and he would sail up and down on his sailboat in the Chesapeake, on the Chesapeake. And they called him Captain Anthony. Well, come to find out, he was my father. Did that ease the tension? Did that ease the whippings as I grew older? No, it didn't. He had a daughter, Lucretia. I called her Miss Lucretia. Miss Lucretia Ard, because she was married to the brother of Hugh Ard, Thomas Ard. <laughs> it's funny because Miss Lucretia did not know that I was her little brother. However, she treated me immensely well. I think it was the G-E-N-E-S, the genes. Somehow the genes knew who we were, even though the physical didn't know who we were and how we were connected. Well, Miss Lucretia would give me extra helpings of food. She would make sure that I was okay. The rest of us slaves who didn't even know our name, didn't know our birth date, we stayed in a cabin, if you will, a shack, if you will, we didn't have the luxury that you all enjoy. Our luxuries, if you will, candle floor, where we would sleep at. And when it's cold outside, we would all muster up together. Well, one night I heard this screeching sound. And it woke me. It frightened me. And I woke up curious as to where this sound was coming. Well, what I did, I got out of my sleeping quarters, if you will, potato sack, and I ran to see where this noise was coming at. And as I got closer, the screeching sound got louder. It turned into screaming and howling. And I would hear something going, tsh, tsh. So I'm curious. So as I run in, and I look down, and I sneak around and look and see what's going on, it's my master. Whipping my Aunt Hester. He has her up like this as such. And her back is wide open. And believe me, every time that whip would hit that body, the blood would come off and splatter into, you'll see different splatters of blood just flying everywhere. And it would leave a streak on my aunt's back as she hollered and screamed. And Master would say, shut up now. If you don't shut up, I'll whip you more. And he said, I'll teach you how to get away off from me. And you better not see that, that slave over there, Ned. If I see you with that slave again, Ned, I'm going to whip you even more. 
The reason he was whipping my aunt was because of the fact that he liked my aunt. And he wanted my aunt for himself. That's why he was whipping. Well, I managed to escape and go back to my quarters. And as I got back to my quarters, I mustered my way back in between all my family members, scared, crying. At that moment, that was my first introduction to being free, wanting to be free. Well, a couple of deaths took place. Lucretia, at this time I'm probably seven or eight years old. Miss Lucretia calls me and she says, Frederick, come, come. And I come to her. Keep in mind, we're not knowing that we are brothers and sisters. I come with my head down and she says, Frederick, I want you to go to the big house. You're going to take a bath. Please understand, at seven or eight years old, this is my first bath in my life. My previous bath was down in the pond where they cook in the pond where the horses and pigs and chickens and you name them go in to swish, drink, and take care of their business. The pond where everybody else would bathe. The pond. And now I got the golden opportunity to go up to the second floor and when I walk into the bathroom, this big white bathtub sitting in the middle of the room, and I look in it, fresh, clean, blue water. Well, I have you know, I didn't hesitate taking them clothes off and jumping in that tub. And I jumped in that tub, and I swooshed, and I enjoyed myself, and I must have been in there for about two hours, seemed like, because Miss Lucretia, at the bottom of the stairwell, calling up, Frederick! What are you doing up there? You've been in there for two hours. I was bathing, ma'am. I was bathing. Well, eventually I get out, dry myself off, and I'll have you know, she came in with a brand new pair of pants, a brand new shirt, and a brand new pair of shoes. Before then, the only thing I had to wear was a gown for a whole year. If I outgrew that gown, I wore nothing else. The slaves, the adult slaves, they got the men, they got a pair of pants, they got a shirt, and a pair of shoes for one year. The women slaves, they got one, one dress for the whole year. You wear it out, welcome to the wind. Well, Mr. Cretia took me outside and loaded me up on a carriage. And as I got in the carriage, the carriage moved on. Next thing I know, I was in Fells Point, Maryland, Baltimore. And as I got off that cart, I noticed the big house that was there awaiting my arrival. I noticed that in front of that big house, there were three people standing in front of the, the big house. One of those people was little Tommy. The other person was Miss Sophia. And he was the brother of Thomas Ard, the husband of Miss Lucretia Ard. So as I approach, quite naturally, we have been trained that in front of white people, we keep our heads down. We don't look at them in their eyes. So as I'm coming down the pathway, I begin to lower my head. And as I get close enough, I see the feet of Miss, Lu Miss Sophia. Miss Sophia, she said, Freddie, Freddie, they call me Freddie, Freddie, Lift your head up so I can see your face. In my mind, I'm saying, this lady must want to kill me. I ain't, I'm not going to lift my head up and die. So she gets to the point where she takes a hand, and she puts it up under my chin, and she lifts my face up. Now, keep in mind, I'm coming up like this. I can feel her. I can feel her presence in my face. And she says, Frederick, open your eyes. Again, I'm thinking to myself, this lady really want to kill me. She's trying to hang me. I'm not going to open up my eyes and look, her, look at her. And she's blowing all on my face as she speaks. And she says, Frederick, I'm telling you to open your eyes. So I open my eyes such as, nice, slowly. And as I look in her face, I see the big blue eyes, the rosy cheeks, and the long layer of teeth, white. And she said, Frederick, this is your new home. And I said, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. 
So all of a sudden, she moves out of the way, and Master Hard steps up. And he says, Frederick, right away, because of that thunder, right away. Yes, Master. He said, you're here to take care of little Tommy. You understand me? Yes, Master. I'm here to take care of little Tommy. All right, and we don't want no stuff out of you. You understand? Yes, Master. And there won't be no stuff out of me. So all of a sudden, little Tommy comes over, and he puts his hand out. I don't know what to do. <laughs> he puts his hand out, and then he takes my hand, and then he shakes it. And I'm like, okay, all right. I mean, I'm lost because I don't know what to do. So anyway, as time goes on, Miss Sophia, she had issues with reading. So there would be times that she would be sitting in the living room reading. It could be a Bible. It could be books, magazines, newspapers. And she's reading. And she had the audacity to say, Frederick, come here, Frederick. So I trot on over to her. And all of a sudden, she says, sit down. So I'm going to sit down. She said, no, sit on the couch. And I'm like, oh, OK. Now, I must let you know that Miss Sophia, she had a spe special liking for me, a special loving for me. She didn't treat me as a slave. She treated me, believe it or not, as her son. And I loved that. So she would have me up there teaching me how to read, and I'm teaching her how to read once I learn how to read. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the door opens, and I'm on the, word, I'm on the letter C, because we're doing the alphabets, A, B, C. As soon as I mention C, there's a thump, boom! And we look, it's Master coming through the door. And Master comes through the door, and he said, Miss Sophia, don't you be in there teaching those little slaves how to read. You teach them how to, how to read, then they're going to want to escape. Don't never let me see you do that again. And Miss Sophia, she looked in a frightened mode like, Phew, I didn't know. And his only response was, now you know. So he comes over to me. You know what I do. I put my head down in such a rush. I'm going to put my neck. All right? So she's, he's standing here and he says, Frederick, don't never let me catch you reading. If I catch you reading, I'm going to whip you. You understand? I'm like, yes, master. I was never going to read. I was hate reading, master. It's no good for you, master. I am never going to read. All right, I'm not playing with you. You let me catch you. Yes, master. That's what came out of my mouth. 